oportunidade, agora a presença do professor Harold Rosenberg, professor daqui do IPA, que falará sobre superfícies completas convexas em H2R ou S2R. Não, eu mudo Não? o título do conferência. <risos> Não. Ok, thank you very much. I was going to begin by telling many good stories about Ellen, but Caesar just told me a few minutes ago that I'm going to be talking in the Mesa about Ellen, so I'll save the good stories for later. Let me just mention that uh, I spoke in the conference in honor of Ellen's 70th birthday, and I sincerely want to be invited to speak in the conference for your 90th birthday. Okay? It's a deal. <laughs> you don't let me down. <laughs> Uh, what I'd like to talk about is uh, convexity. So consider a submanifold, say, of Euclidean space. N will always be at least 2. And I'm always going to suppose that sigma is a complete hypersurface. And orient up. And when I write this, I'll always mean this for the whole talk. So I never have to write that again. Now, one has a notion of local convexity in Euclidean space. So, local convexity, which you've all certainly seen, but let me say what it is anyway because I want you to think of what this notion means in a Ramanian manifold. In Euclidean space, you say that sigma is locally convex at a point P if, so it's, I'll say locally convex at P, if you can find some neighborhood U of P in sigma, that's on one side of its tangent plane use on one side <coughs> of the tangent plane sigma at P. And you say it's strictly locally convex, strictly locally convex, if the intersection of this neighborhood with the tangent plane is precisely the point P. So one has these two notions. And the interesting question is, assuming that this submanifold sigma is locally convex or strictly locally convex, what global properties of sigma can you conclude? So what global properties of sigma does this imply? And uh, typical global properties that interest me are, for example, is sigma embedded in the ambient space instead of just being immersed? No self-intersections. So that's one interesting property. Another interesting property is, what is its topology? Can you say anything about its topology? Manfredo and Ellen wrote a paper in 1971 which contains some very nice ideas that I'm going to use today. So let me just tell you the theorem in this paper. So suppose that we consider a complete orientable hypersurface sigma in Rn plus 1. Now, this notion of uh, local convexity is related to the principal curvatures, the second fundamental form. If, if it's locally convex at P, what happens to the second fundamental form of sigma? So this uh,
has eigenvalues, the principal curvatures, and uh, if it's locally convex in the neighborhood of P, then this will be greater than or equal to zero. Let's say it's in the neighborhood of P. This condition here, when I write this, means that all the principal curvatures have the same sign in the neighborhood of the point of this second fundamental form, the shape operator. And uh, greater than or equal to zero means they can be zero. And if I say strictly greater than zero, I mean that all the principal curvatures are positive at the point or in a neighborhood. So local convexity in Euclidean space is just related to the principal curvatures having the same sign at the point or in a neighborhood. So their theorem, ah, and then one other remark, the Gauss equation says that the second fundamental form having this property is equivalent to all the sectional curvatures of the submanifold being having a sign. So that theorem then is stated in terms of the sectional curvatures. I'll change the statement of your theorem, if you'll permit me to say in terms of the second fundamental form. The theorem is this. So suppose that one has this condition on all points of sigma. So all the eigenvalues have the same sign with respect to the orientation you chose. And that there's one point P, at least one point, P and sigma, where all the eigenvalues are strictly positive. Then, one <clears throat> sigma is an embedded sphere or plane. Sigma is an embedded sphere of dimension n or Euclidean space of dimension n and is the boundary of a convex body in the ambient space. Bounds a convex body. in the ambient space. I'll make a little remarks about this. This is a long story here. This is really a, contained in the theorem of Sachstetter, but there's a long history to this, this property here. Two, <coughs> for almost all unit vectors on the unit sphere, that's the unit sphere centered at the origin, if I consider the plane orthogonal to this unit vector, P of nu is equal to nu perp. So here's this unit vector. That's P of nu, this plane. And look at the intersection of this plane with sigma. Then the intersection P of nu intersection sigma is either topologically Sn, Sn minus 1, or Rn minus 1, topologically, or a point, or empty. Moreover, one can say what the total curvature of sigma is. What does that mean? So that was 2, this is 3. The total curvature is the area of the image of sigma by the Gauss map measured with multiplicity. And in terms of this uh, second fundamental form, it's the determinant. It's the product of the eigenvalues integrated over sigma. So the total curvature. of sigma, which is equal to the integral over sigma of the, uh, let me just write the determinant of the Gauss map, and you per, if you permit me, I'll call the Gauss map the normal vector nu. This quantity here is either equal to the volume of the unit sphere, Sn1, if sigma is compact, or 
it's less than or equal to one-half that volume. Otherwise, when it's complete, not compact. Moreover, they gave a geometric picture of what happens in this case. Namely, in fact, sigma is a graph over an open domain in an end plane. And the Gaussian image is contained in the hemisphere of the end sphere. So I won't write that down. This will come up later. So also, this implies that here's this end plane, and sigma is a graph over this plane, and the Gaussian image, nu, is contained in a hemisphere of the unit sphere. It's the ideas in this theorem uh, that I really like and use, which consists roughly of analyzing how convex embedded submanifolds can vary when you start varying the submanifold continuously in some space, for example, in a plane. We'll come against this, across this question later on. Consider, for example, the Euclidean plane. Consider an embedded convex curve strictly convex, say, and start varying continuously among strictly convex curves. What are all accidents that can happen? Or ask yourself the same question in the hyperbolic plane. Take the hyperbolic plane and take a strictly convex embedded curve and start varying that continuously among such curves. What are the accidents that can happen? And this kind of an analysis in geometry is going to be very useful for answering the question that uh, I asked before. And my goal is to put this subject into uh, other Ramanian manifolds than just the space forms. So let me just say a little bit of the history of what was done in Euclidean space by others. The first theorem I know about, the global theorem, is Hadamard, who proved that uh, if you consider this situation of sigma n immersed in Rn plus 1 compact, without boundary naturally, orientable, and you suppose now that all the eigenvalues are strictly positive, and uh, on sigma, then sigma is an embedded sphere and bounds a convex body. Sigma is an embedded sphere, the boundary of a convex body. That was the first global theorem I know of in this subject. And uh, you notice you need n greater than or equal to 2 for this to be true. What? Uh, no. Here it's true because it's compact. But strictly positive just means that, that at every point, all the eigenvalues are strictly positive. They could go to 0 on the complete case. OK. So. Uh, Uh, for n, for, for curves in the plane, this is not true, right? You can certainly take a strictly convex curve in the plane that's immersed. So for n equals 1, it's certainly not true that this theorem is true. This theorem begins to be true from 2 on. The next person to make an important contribution is he the next really history stoker? Mm. Right. OK, stoker. So he considered surfaces in R3, which are now just complete and orientable. 
And he allowed the uh, second fundamental form of sigma to have zero eigenvalues, but he supposed they're always of the same sign, greater than or equal to zero at every point. And now it's just complete, not compact. Then, uh, can you conclude that it's embedded, for example? In general, no, because if I take this curve here, gamma, and I take gamma cross r, the cylinder over this curve, the cylinder over this curve satisfies this condition. One of the eigenvalues is zero, the r factor, that's a principal curvature, and the other eigenvalue is strictly positive. So this is an example of an immersion, a complete immersion, of, that satisfies this condition, it's locally convex in the sense, it's not embedded. But what uh, Stoker discovered was if he added the, the following hypothesis, if there exists one point P, oh, did I say, did I add that hypothesis in your theorem, Ellen? Or did I forget that hypothesis? One second. There exists one point P in sigma such that all the eigenvalues of sigma at p are strictly positive, this hypothesis, then indeed everything is okay. Then sigma is an embedded sphere or plane. And uh, if it's a sphere, it bounds a convex body. If it's a plane, then indeed it's a graph over an open, do an open domain. It's a vertical graph like this. This is a very, very nice uh, theorem of Stoker, which is in his book on differential geometry. It's a very nice book on differential geometry, and he proves it in that, in that book. I'm vaguely worried that in the statement of Manfredo Zinelin's theorem, I left out this hypothesis. They need this hypothesis for the theorem. Hmm? What? Did I? The cylinder doesn't satisfy it. Right, that's why I said that. I was afraid I left it out. I forgot. So you were supposed to... Oh, no, I, I, get I put it in. Thank you. I was, I was having the impression the first time I wrote that down. Okay. So that, that was Hadamard's theorem. There were other people after Hadamard who proved theorems, Chern and Lashoff, uh, Van Hoogenort, Hartman and Wintner and Hartman. But the, the, the big theorem was in 1960 was Sachstetter. Sachstetter solved the general case in Euclidean space, that is, so consider hypersurfaces, complete, orientable, such that all you assume is the eigenvalues have a sign on sigma. You don't assume anything else. So we know cylinders are possible. And what Sachs had approved is that then sigma is equal to a hypercylinder hyper, hyper cylinder, or sigma equals an embedded sphere or Euclidean space. So that's a very, very nice, complete description of what happens in Euclidean space for this question. Now, what about other manifolds? <clears throat> I think the next paper was by Manfredo and uh, Warner, in which they considered what happens in the three sphere. So the theorem they proved was, suppose sigma is immersed in the three-sphere and compact. And suppose that 
the uh, principal curvatures are at least one at each point. So I look at, the, I look at this second fundamental form, and I write greater than or equal to one. So this means that both principal curvatures are greater than or equal to one at each point. One is the, the, uh, the value you get for the geodesic spheres in the three-sphere. Their normal curvatures are one. So uh, under this hypothesis, then sigma is an embedded sphere. So the theorem is true there in this compact situation. The, moreover, they proved another thing very interesting geometrically. They proved it isometrically rigid. You take two such immersions, they differ by an ambient isometry of the three sphere. I have not at all thought, and as far as I know, nobody has thought about what happens in the three sphere if it's just complete, not compact. That's an interesting question. I don't think anybody's ever thought about it. The next uh, result in the space forms is in hyperbolic three space, and there there's a uh, theorem of Curie. We proved in hyperbolic three space, consider a surface immersed in H3. And suppose all the principal curvatures are at least one. One here is the value of the principal curvatures of spheres in hyperbolic three space. So here, spheres play the role of planes in Euclidean space. Then. Sigma is an embedded plane. That is, topologically, it's R2. Moreover, he gave examples where this is not true if this is not true. In other words, there are surfaces who, there are surfaces such that this is true, which are immersed, not embedded. You can, fabric, you can construct such surfaces if I take the ball model for H3 and take a geodesic and take a tube around it. So that certainly has, it's a tubular neighborhood, that certainly has a positive extrinsic curvature, which is between 0 and 1. The principal curvatures there are between 0 and 1. Well, this one is, is small. And you can perturb this to make this immersed in a positive extrinsic curvature. So it's not true without that hypothesis. Uh, I mentioned one other person who has worked on this subject is Stephanie Alexander, who proved theorems of this nature in Hadamard manifolds. And aside from that, I know of no other work of this kind of question in other Riemannian manifolds. So I want to look at what happens in other Riemannian manifolds. For this, this sort of question. <clears throat> and uh, you won't be too surprised if the Romanian manifolds I want to look at are the next simplest after the space forms. So after the space forms R3, S3, and uh, H3, we have these homogeneous three manifolds, E of kappa tau, which have more symmetry than any other of the simply connected three manifolds aside from the space forms. They have a four-dimensional isometry group. So these are the next symmetric three manifolds after the space forms. What are they? What are these manifolds? These are Riemannian submersions over two-dimensional space forms, M2 of kappa. What is M2 of kappa? It's <coughs> the two-sphere of curvature kappa when kappa is positive. It's the Euclidean plane when kappa is 0. And it's the hyperbolic plane of curvature kappa when kappa is negative. So this is just a two-dimensional space form of curvature kappa. This is a Riemannian submersion. The fiber here is uh, a killing vector field, which is uh, 
each orbit is geodesic. And tau is the bundle curvature. Tau is the bundle curvature. <clears throat> Another way to think of these manifolds is the following picture. Ah, if I want to have a manifold different from a space form, then the condition that be true is that kappa minus 4 tau squared be different from 0. If you want to make sure you don't get a three-sphere of curvature kappa, not kappa, a certain quantity, or a hyperbolic space or Euclidean space, you need this condition. So uh, let's take first tau equals zero, kappa positive, kappa equals zero, kappa negative, and tau different from zero. So tau equals zero, kappa greater than zero. It's a trivial bundle. The bundle curvature is zero. So this is just a two-sphere of curvature kappa cross r. Kappa equals zero, tau equals zero, that's just uh, Euclidean space, so we won't fill this in because it's a space form. Kappa less than zero, it's the product of the space form H2 of curvature kappa cross R. So those are the simplest on the list. Tau different from zero, kappa greater than zero, those are the Berger spheres. When kappa minus 4 tau squared is equal to 0, you get S3. So this is a deformation of the three-sphere with the round metric where you change the length of the fibers. Instead of having fibers of length 2 pi, you make them shorter or longer, and you get what's so-called the Berger spheres. Incidentally, I asked Berger last June why they called Berger spheres, and he said he has no idea. He has nothing to do with these whatsoever. <laughs> it's really strange. Anyway, everybody calls them Berger spheres. Kappa equals zero, so we're, we're a bundle over R2. Tau different from zero. This is Heisenberg space. It's the Ramanian Niels 3. And kappa less than zero, tau different from zero. It's the twisted bundle over the hyperbolic plane, which is PSL2 R tilde. It's also the universal covering space of the unit tangent bundle of the hyperbolic plane. So one has these very symmetric manifolds. They have a four-dimensional isometry group. The Ramanian submersions, the five is a killing field. You have a notion of a vertical. And it's very interesting to look at the geometry in these manifolds. There's one other very interesting manifold that's not on this list because its isometry group is of dimension three, and it's solved three. And from the point of view of convexity, this is a very interesting manifold. I'll, I'll show you why today. But for, for what I'm talking about, this is also very interesting. And let me just mention that the Thurston geometries consist of eight manifolds, the space forms, and all of these manifolds except the Berger spheres. Take away the Berger spheres, take these, plus solve three, and you can build up any Ramanian three manifold. That's the geometrization theorem conjectured by Thurston and proved by Perlman and others. So these are the building blocks of any three-manifold from the point of view of Ramanian geometry. OK, so let's start talking about uh, some of these manifolds. Let me, let me begin by proving a theorem in Heisenberg space, and then a theorem in solve three, and then get to where I can really prove better theorems in these trivial bundles, S2 cross R, H2 cross R. So let's uh, begin by Heisenberg space. Let me just give you a model for Heisenberg space, which I'm sure most of you have never seen before, but 
it's R3, so top large of Heisenberg space is R3, and the metric is, I'll give you the value tau is equal to one half. That's the metric, so this is bundle curvature one half. And uh, let me tell you some properties of the space. So the vertical killing field here is the, is the z-axis. This is the vertical killing field. So uh, ddz is the fiber of the fibration over R2. So the fibration over R2 is clearly just the x and y coordinates here. That's an isometric projection. This is the Euclidean metric. Uh, what I'm going to use now is that all the vertical planes, Euclidean vertical planes, are minimal surfaces in this space. The Euclidean in X, Y, Z. Euclidean vertical planes are minimal minimal surfaces, whose principal curvatures are plus and minus one. Kappa one is equal to minus kappa two is equal to one. And all these vertical planes are isometric by Nambient isometry. The isometries of Heisenberg space are certain translations coming from killing fields, left invariant killing fields here, plus the translation along the z-axis, that's an isometry, plus all Euclidean rotations around the z-axis passing through 0, 0. And any other vertical fiber, there's a rotation group of rotations around it. So you have this four-dimensional isometry group, and if you think about it, that permits you to send any vertical plane into any other vertical plane by an isometry. So all of these vertical planes uh, are minimal, and in principal curvatures, you can calculate satisfy that condition. One other very important property is the induced metric on these vertical planes is Euclidean. They're flat. You can just see that by taking just one vertical plane and calculate what this induced metric is on that vertical plane and see that it's a constant times dx squared plus another constant times dy squared. So it's very easy to see that every vertical plane with this induced metric is flat. They're not, to they're not totally geodesic. These are not... Uh, flat in the ambient space. As a matter of fact, in Heisenberg space, there are no little, even small surfaces that are totally geodesic. You can never find such surfaces in this space. OK, now let's get back to that question that uh, I talked about. Suppose you take a Euclidean plane, for example, one of these vertical planes in Heisenberg space. And suppose you take an embedded strictly convex compact curve. So you can take a, a Euclidean plane, R2, you take C, an embedded strictly convex curve. And you start varying it continuously in this Euclidean plane among such curves. What can happen as an accident? Well, so here you have a start off with some curves, strictly convex. You start varying it. Certainly for small deformations, it's embedded, strictly convex. And if you think about it, you can never bring two points like this to have a self-intersection. That's impossible. It wouldn't be convex. An accident that can happen is it could disappear. It could just go off to infinity in this space, and you have nothing left at a certain time in the deformation. That's a trivial accident. What's the other accident? It can open up into one curve. Like this. One point on it can go off to infinity. You get longer and longer and longer, and one point goes off to infinity. But you can't have two points going off to infinity. 
That's impossible. Because if two points went off to infinity, you'd have a strictly convex curve in the, in the plane, another strictly convex curve in the plane, but they'd have to intersect. It's impossible. So only one point can go off to infinity. Now, suppose this happens at a certain stage, and then you keep on going, keep on deforming this among strictly convex curves. What can happen? Well, it can disappear, it can stay like this. You cannot have another point going off to infinity. If another point goes off to infinity, the two, two curves would have to intersect. What might happen is it might become compact again. Right? This point, you might, uh, next stage of deformation, just come back into space from infinity. And then you're back where you started. But that's all you can get is a deformation. But now if you think about it, if you think of these curves being put together in some space of one higher dimension, like R2 cross R, you can create a surface of infinite genus like this. Uh, not infinite genus, of infinite topology. Why? Let's, let's start with a point. So we start these curves, curves, curves like this. And then we get to this situation. When you get to this situation, what does that mean? You have a point here, but now the curve became open at this point. And then you can go on for a while like this if you want, just topologically. And then you become compact again. Topologically, what is this? Topologically, this is just a disk with a, with a puncture. This is topologically this with a puncture. Here is an interval, but that's, that's equivalent to this topologically. But then I can do the same thing again an infinite number of times. So I can put as many punctures as I want by just repeating this process. So if in some situation you see intersection trace curves with affoliation by planes that are looking like this, you can create a surface that has infinite topology. So this is something that can happen in a very natural, easy way. But as far as these convex curves are concerned in the Euclidean plane, this is all that can happen. In the hyperbolic plane, it's more complicated. Suppose you start with a, a compact embedded curve in the hyperbolic plane. So I take the disk model. That's infinity. I can take any closed set on this curve. Any closed set, a can't set if you want. And I can go off to infinity to uh, create limits like this. Well, let's take a simple example. Just take an interval on the curve and let the interval go off to infinity like this. Now, there's no, no reason why I can't do this for two intervals at the same time, because the, in hyperbolic space, there's lots of room. I can't do this in Euclidean plane, because they would have to intersect. But in the hyperbolic plane, they don't have to intersect. So if you're working with foliations by hyperbolic planes, as we will in the group solve three, then you have to worry about <coughs> situations like this, if you're looking at traces of convex surfaces. OK, so now let's look at, at Heisenberg space. <clears throat> so suppose I claim the following is true, theorem. Suppose sigma is immersed in uh, Heisenberg space and uh, 2 sigma is positive, sigma compact. Then sigma is an embedded sphere. So it's the Hadamard theorem in Heisenberg space. Proof. We have this compact submanifold. Take some vertical plane in this Euclidean XYZ coordinate system and 
move it up until you touch at a point. When I touch at a point, because of, oh, oh, uh, I'm sorry, I forgot a hypothesis. I forgot the hypothesis, very embarrassing. But uh, I need to assume that the principal curvatures are strictly greater than one. Okay? Then I, I need a, a, a lemma. Under this condition, you see the principal curvatures of these vertical planes here are plus and minus one. So if I suppose P is a vertical plane in this space, then sigma intersection P is equal to a union of strictly convex curves in P. Now, P is a Euclidean plane. The metric is Euclidean, so this makes sense to talk about strictly convex. And points, isolated points. Or empty. Doesn't intersect at all. The point is that it's transverse intersections, except at these isolated points, and the intersections are strictly convex curves. This is just a simple calculation with differential geometry. That if the principal curvatures curve more than the principal curvatures of this space, then any intersection is indeed transverse and strictly convex. <clears throat> okay? So in particular, if I look at the first point where I intersect Oh, so just let me mention, these strictly convex curves, here's my plane P, they might be like this, right? Here's the points. There might be lots of different branches, connected components, another one, another one. The intersection might be horrible. They're strictly convex, but it can be a real mess. So how do you manage to get something embedded out of it? Okay, I'll show you. So we take this first point of contact. Because of this lemma that I said, the surface is strictly locally on one side of this vertical plane. And if I take a vertical plane parallel to it, the intersection is a strictly convex curve that's embedded. So these intersection curves are strictly convex and embedded in these vertical planes. So now I'm taking a family of a foliation of Heisenberg space by these parallel minimal surfaces to this initial plane. It starts off being compact and embedded. So think of these curves as being strictly convex embedded curves in a Euclidean plane. By the discussion we just had, what are the accidents that can happen? The accidents that can happen is this continues being convex and embedded, or there's one point that goes off to infinity. That can't happen because I'm assuming compact. Or it just becomes a point, which has to happen because the whole surface is compact. So what happens is point. This is the surface. It's an embedded sphere, a union of these strictly convex embedded curves. So that's the simple case. The more difficult case, sigma complete with principal curvatures bigger than one. Inya Silva, who's here, gave me a paper yesterday in which she thinks she can prove this. I haven't read the paper. This is, it becomes much more difficult when, when uh, it's complete, not compact. So we'll just, complete, non compact, we don't know for the moment. But it's perhaps in this manuscript that she gave me. <clears throat> okay, that's Heisenberg space. Let's quickly do another space. Let's take solve three. As I said in a talk I gave here a while back, I used to think this was a dirty word, but now I discovered it's a beautiful space. 
maybe many of you people still think it's a dirty word, but let me tell you what the space is and why it's beautiful. So this is also R3 with the following metric. Now, so I'll use coordinates x, y, s. So it's e to the 2s dx squared plus e to the minus 2s dy squared plus ds squared. That's the metric. OK, this has three orthogonal foliations. I call these planes, but that's in the Euclidean sense. The planes, uh, x equals constant, it means x equals constant, y and s vary. The planes, y equals constant, and the planes, s equals constant. These planes, P of x and P of y, are totally geodesic, isometric to the hyperbolic plane. Totally geodesic, isometric to the hyperbolic plane. In fact, if you take, for example, y equals 0, so you're taking e to the 2s dx squared plus ds squared, you can make a change of variables. S is equal to minus log t, and that becomes dx squared plus dt squared over t squared, the hyperbolic metric. So it's the hyperbolic metric. And what you're seeing, the S flow is just in this plane. This is the S coordinate, the higher cycle. It's the higher cycle flow. Here's the, I said y is constant. This is x. So it's the, <coughs> falling along the s direction contracts the x curves exponentially. And it's the, it's the stable manifold in this three manifold of the anisor flow given by the flow DDS. DDS is an anisor flow. And if you look at the two plane, y is equal to constant, x and s vary, that two plane is invariant by the flow and it's contracted exponentially as you go along the s flow. Similarly, if you look at the other plane, x is equal to constant, y varies. It's also a hyperbolic plane, and it's the unstable manifold. You reverse the direction, so you're expanding the higher cycles. So this is the, a model, very simple model for the Anisov flow. P of s is not totally geodesic. So these x, y planes are not totally geodesic, but they're minimal surfaces, they're minimal. And they have the eigenvalues plus and minus 1 principal curvatures are plus and minus 1. The y equals x direction, y equals minus x direction are the principal direction. This, this has a very uh, important property for geometry, these foliations. These, this foliation by x equals constant, each of these planes invariant by an ambient isometry, a symmetry. If you look at this metric here and you replace y by minus y, you'll see that it leaves the x0, s plane Invariant. And it's an isometry of the metric. So you have a foliation by totally geodesic submanifolds, planes, and each one of them is invariant by an isometry. So you can do lots of techniques that we do in this subject, like Alexandrov reflection with this foliation. And you can prove Alexandrov's theorem that any embedded sphere of constant mean curvature, no, any embedded, compact embedded surface of constant mean curvature is in fact topologically a sphere doing Alexander's reflection with the x-planes, and then with the orthogonal planes, the y-planes. You get an invariant under two symmetries like this, so it has genus zero. So this is a great place to do geometry. What about convexity here? Well, let me show you by the same techniques uh, a result. <clears throat> The result is that uh, <clears throat> this theorem. So take sigma in solve three, compact, and uh, just assume local convexity. 
Uh, yeah, right. Now I don't have to assume anything about, about the eigenvalues. Just this. Just assume this. Then sigma is an embedded sphere. So it's the Hadamard theorem in this space. Proof. Well, now, so here's our x, y, the Anosov flow, s. And we have this foliation by y is equal to constant planes that are totally geodesic and isometric to the hyperbolic plane. These planes here are models of the hyperbolic plane. And they're totally geodesic. So again, you can prove that for any such plane like this, when you take sigma intersection, this plane, P, it's a union of points and strictly convex curves, immersed. Well, you might have many of them. But it's the same algebraic differential geometry lemma before that proves this. No, no, no hypothesis on principal curvatures because this is totally geodesic. It's flat in the ambient space. So let's take the highest plane. Sigma is compact. Let's take the highest plane. The intersection is a point. Again, by this convexity assumption, when you take a plane lower down, you get a strictly convex curve. Now, you have a family of convex embedded, strictly convex embedded curves in hyperbolic planes. Well, in hyperbolic planes, when you do this, what accident can happen? As I said before, it can be horrible. It can open up in many different places at infinity. But if we assume that sigma is compact, nothing opens up. So these com compact curves have to stay compact and embedded. They stay compact and embedded. No accident can happen. So it's a sphere. Comes a point again. So it's an embedded sphere. The complete case, I don't have any idea. Complete case, the Stoker theorem or the Saxeter theorem, much more difficult for the moment. I don't, I don't know. Let me just mention, this is a very strange situation here, because in the other spaces, the other homogeneous three manifolds, I could construct many, many examples of embedded spheres of, of extrinsic, positive extrinsic curvature, convex. I can even construct examples of constant positive extrinsic curvature, because you have rotation group, rotation around the vertical fiber isometries. You just write down the differential equation for a trace curve to produce a surface of constant curvature. You solve the differential equation. There's no rotations here. This is a three-dimensional isometry group. There's no rotations. I have no idea how to write down examples. How do you write down examples here? Can't do it. So the basic question is, when do there exist such spheres that are convex? When do such spheres in SOPS exist? This is, I have no idea how to, uh, how to attack this problem. The only, the only way I know how to attack it, which involves a lot of work, is for very large values of the extrinsic curvature, when the eigenvalues are very, very big. So the extrinsic curvature is the product of the principal curvatures. If this is very big, there's some negative infinity, that you can solve by nonlinear analysis the existence of even a foliation around a point of Ke equals constant spheres. So this is a whole different story using nonlinear analysis, elliptic theory, to produce this for very big values of K. So the question is, what's the, what are the values of K for which you can do this? In the other spaces, like Heisenberg space, rotations group lets you do it for all values of K. In solve three, I don't know. OK, I started. Uh, 10 minutes late. So do I have 10 minutes or? Yes? <laughs> I did start late. But I was supposed, supposed to stop early, right? <laughs> I would stop at 3.50. Well, let me mention, I didn't talk about what I was supposed to talk about, which I was going to talk about now, which is what happens in H2 cross R. That's the, that's the one space where Antonio Galvez and, and Josie Espinar and I have managed to solve completely the problem. 
So let me just tell you the theorem and not talk about the proof. <clears throat> the proof involves uh, more geometry, more analysis. From the theorem, this is with two Spanish colleagues, Jose Galvez and Jose Espinal. So we considered sigma immersed in H2 cross R. And we looked at the Hadamard case when it was locally strictly convex at each point. So it's complete. It's not necessarily compact. Then the conclusion is sigma is an embedded sphere or plane. And you can say what happens when it's a plane. Ge geometrically, you can say how it's sitting in, in the space. Moreover, if the extrinsic curvature is constant, so it's positive, it's a pr product of principal curvatures. If it's constant, then sigma equals a rotational sphere. One doesn't have round spheres in these spaces. There's no umbilical sphere. The interesting spheres are the rotational spheres of a given curvature. So these spheres exist for every value of the extrinsic curvature positive, the rotational spheres. And this theorem says that any compact, uh, not only compact, any complete surface immersed in this space H cross R, whose uh, constant extrinsic curvature is compact equal to one of these rotational spheres. It's much more difficult than what we've been talking about here using just soft techniques of drawing pictures. You have to do some analysis. Okay, I'll stop there. But just let me mention that what's interesting is doing this sort of thing in other spaces. Nobody's ever done it. It's just in the last uh, two years, say, that we've begun to think about this. But convexity in other Riemannian manifolds, it's an open subject. Convexity in Euclidean space has been studied for years and years and years. But in other remaining manifolds, it just nobody's really ever looked at it. Okay, thank you very much.